It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, a Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Tuesday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much, everybody, for making Real Ag Radio and, of course, Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. Also, a big shout-out to everybody listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast. Looking forward to playing for you today a very important discussion really across Canada. And, and, and quite frankly, you know what, honestly, this also applies to the U.S. as well. As, we, as we've seen challenges when it comes to provincial, state, federal, national funding of egg extension. There was a way that egg extension happened, probably in our, our grandparents' time, our parents' time. It, it's really changing. And it, the Internet is, is like a, a thing that exists now, clearly, that wasn't around 25 years ago. From an, as an extension tool, that's just one example. But we have to ask ourselves, and I, I, this is in this conversation, this question is being discussed in in all jurisdictions. What is the future of extension? What does the future of extension have to look like? And that's what today's episode of Real Ag Radio is all about. And this is a this is a new episode of the Egg Policy Connection podcast that's hosted by Kelvin Hepner. So you're going to hear Kelvin throughout the show. He does a great job hosting this podcast. We, this is season two. Last year, they looked at, you know, what, were, what are some of the big policy decisions that were made in the past, and how did we get there, and what's happened since? And really, in season two, we've been looking more forward. What are some of the things... That the big topics that need to be discussed need to have debate because we need to move forward on them. If Canada, you know, Canada can only talk for so long, we actually also need some action. And that's a big part of what the Ag Policy Connection podcast does. And it is also brought to you by, in partnership with CAPI. You often hear Tyler McCann, the managing director of CAPI, on this show on the Friday issues panel. Uh, really, Cappy is a great partner on this podcast. And like I said, Kelvin does a great job hosting it. So we're going to talk all about the future of extension today. Now, if you have any feedback on this topic, we'd love to hear from you. We want your perspectives as well. That's an important component of this. I don't care if you're in Canada or in the U.S. Let's talk about this topic because it's critical for farmers and ranchers across North America, okay? So your, your examples you're going to hear today are Canadian, but it applies to everybody. So if you have any feedback, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Or, of course, you can find Real Agriculture across all the social media platforms. You're also more than welcome to call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we're going to get started. We're going to hear the Ag Policy Connection podcast with Kelvin Hepner, brought to you by Cappy. We're talking about the future of egg extension. We'll get to it when we come back, right after this. Hey, Sandy. Mike, nice to see you. We're meeting next week, but I just wanted to ask, who would you recommend I talk to about financing my operating expenses this growing season? Easy. Call CCGA. Their APP cash advances are flexible and can save you thousands in financing costs. You can get up to $250,000 interest-free, and anything over that is below prime. Great idea. I'll call them tomorrow. And check out ccga.ca. Cash advances are made under the Government of Canada's advanced payments program i get to spend every day talking to farmers in the ag industry through realagriculture.com and real ag radio but nothing is more fun than speaking to an audience live and in person if you're planning an ag event book a real agriculture speaker to make it a successful and memorable experience email s haney at realagriculture.com and you can book myself or any other real ag personality to speak at your event bring your audience all the fun insight and energy of real agriculture. 
Peter Johnson at WheatPeteRealAgriculture.com. And what an opportunity. Oh, my gosh. You think you can't grow better wheat? You are absolutely wrong. We're going to show you how to strive for those record wheat yields that they get in the UK and in New Zealand. You can grow 150 bushel wheat. I'll show you how. Catch Wheat Pete's Word every Wednesday on realagriculture.com or download the podcast on iTunes or Spotify. As I mentioned, we are focusing today on the future of ag extension. This segment's brought to you by Viatude. The new fungicide for canola and soybeans get best in class protection from two of the strongest scrolatini and white mold actives on the market. I'm going to pass it over to Kelvin Hepner to introduce our panel talking about the future of egg extension. On this episode of the Egg Policy Connection, we're focusing on uh, the future of extension and knowledge transfer in agriculture. And we're pleased to welcome our uh, three panelists. We have uh, Adaharal Chowdhury of uh, the University of Guelph, Joy Agnew at Olds College, and Jake Legui, farmer based in Saskatchewan and the director with Sask Wheat. Thank you, all three of you, for uh, taking time from your busy schedules to uh, join us here on the Ag Policy Connection. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for inviting. Let's start with uh, kind of defining extension, what we mean by this term in an agricultural context. Joy, why don't we start with you? What do you see the word extension and the function of extension being? Uh, sometimes it depends on the day, I guess. There is there is no real well-defined um, solution or, or answer, I guess, to that. But in, in my opinion, it's, it's really, at, at its core, it's getting information, the right information in the right format into the hands of the people that can actually use it to, to make good management decisions. And so that, that comes in a whole bunch of different forms. And like I said, depending on the, the type of farm or farming production system that might even look a little bit different, but it, it's all about just getting good information, practical information into the hands of the people that can use it. Adaharl, in your role, you've had some experience uh, working in extension or watching extension happen globally. Uh, why is it important and, and how do you see it? Uh, what do you see as the, the core function of extension? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just want to add what Joy mentioned. Uh, like extension for me is not only about transferring information it's more than this um so information is an important uh, element uh but then when you uh, actually transfer the information how the information is being used that's also part of the extension uh so transferring information is something i mean which more resonate to me is more science communication for example right but extension is, for me, is more broader than this. And in the past, let's say from now, 20 years or 30 years back, we thought extension as a like a, a, a like a, a connection between research and and farmers. But now it's more than this because in agriculture now there are not only research, extension, and farmers. Think about like. Uh, the fertilizer input dealers, right? Think about like technology provider, especially digital technology provider. So extension um, have to play as a brokering role of information that being yeah, of course generated in research, but also in other sources, and and help farmers to make you know informed decisions. But that decision is not only based on information. It's more than this. It's more is related to policy. It's related to what's happening around the community, right? It's more than this. Jake, how about from your perspective as a, as a grower, uh, where do you or what do you see as extension uh, in your interaction with extension and, and the value it provides to you? Yeah, I think... You know, in that context, I, I guess I would think about it as something pretty simple. It's just how do I get access to information in the scientific literature and in government policy and all of these things to do the best job that I can on my farm? How do I take that information and make it useful? Um, that's the role. That's what I think extension is for as far as the way I understand it is, is that connection between me and you know, government, literature, scientists, all those, all those parties. 
So I think you're still in the young farmer category, but uh, you've, you've probably seen some changes and some trends in, uh, in terms of how extension works. Uh, can you make any or share any observations there in terms of how, how you th- no- differences you've noticed over, uh, over the last decade or two? Yeah, it's uh, honestly, in, in some ways, it's lessened, um, I would say, from the government point of view. Um, our ministry office has a smaller role than it used to have. Um, I don't know if that was intentional or just a slow erosion of, you know, government funding that seems to be an issue in a lot of places. But I would say at the same time, we've had a significant increase in extension services from, you know, professional agronomists and people that our farm and a whole pile of other farms and friends and neighbors rely on, you know, yeah, we pay these, these individuals to, uh, to help our farms out, but it's good value because we can, we can take what they're saying and actually apply it directly to what we're doing rather than sort of more the generalized extension services that often comes from government. This is much more specific. And I would also say that there's been more of an effort from, um, you know, crop commissions like, like SAS Sweet, for example, just to give ourselves a shameless plug here, we've got, you know, we've, we've really stepped up a lot of the extension work that we're doing to try and fill that gap because I would say that we've realized it is a bit of a gap that farmers don't have access to the same extension services that they might've had access to, you know, two decades ago. Yeah. Joy, Jake just talked about the, the perceived at least decline. And in some cases it is a very real decline in, uh, in public investment in extension work. So we have this public versus private shift or public versus to commodity organization, where it's still a shared cost among a large group. Uh, how do you see that looking in the future in terms of uh, how these, how this communication happens, how this information is made available to farmers in terms of that public versus private approach? Yeah, the, the role of, of government in ag, ag knowledge transfer and ag extension is definitely a hot topic in Alberta right now, as I would say it's less of a slow erosion and it was just a massive cut um, yeah. a couple of years ago. So definitely lots of discussion over the last couple of years about how to how to bring that back together or, or provide that that extension service back to Alberta producers and still still a work in progress. I know there's been a lot of discussion about a sort of a public private partnership or a, a standalone not-for-profit entity to try to coordinate extension services in Alberta, but similar similar to Saskatchewan, a lot of um, the producer associations or producer groups here and and even agronomists are, are trying to fill that gap. But the the challenge with that is that it's it's now not coordinated in any way. Um, there's there's not sort of a long-term strategy or plan on how to do that really effectively, and by kind of disjointing it and sort of pushing pushing out the responsibility now to uh, not-for-profit entities or sometimes even for-profit entities. It's just, it's putting the entire structure at risk and producers are definitely wondering where to go to get reliable, unbiased, um, good information to make to make decisions. So Adaharl, when we look at the, the benefits, there is a, a public good or uh, a broader societal return on investment from invent, uh, investment in extension, but at the same time, governments are facing fiscal constraints, and it's a, a challenge to uh, for them to. This is a, an area where there isn't an immediate uh, electoral consequence if they if they cut investment to uh, extension. How do you see this unfolding in terms of uh, the value versus who pays? Uh, model of uh, of extension in the future. Yeah, I think extension um, is still uh, is very relevant for public sector investment. Um, uh, unfortunately, I mean, um, I, I take the uh, you know blame like for probably you know it's it's easy to take blame on us like as a scholarly community. We probably didn't do much um, and extension in in Canada across Canada, like especially extension education has died out, right? And in um, whole Canada, only University of Guelph provide a graduate degree, which we call capacity development extension, and we are still struggling. So I'm talking about from it from an educator perspective. Um, so that is, I think, has been you know absence for a long time. 
And then, you know, when uh, education is there and those we, we produce, like, or we create new generation of professionals, they work in different sectors, right? They, they also influence policy, right? And so that's not happening, right? Um, I, I am hearing about Alberta. It's same in Ontario, too. There is, you know, uh, less support for public uh, uh, funding for extension. But um, I think, to me, like, we are probably not going to, like, 20 years back in Canada when we enjoyed, you know, uh, public sector extension. But I think it's important for everyone, for farmers, for educators, for, you know, advisors, right, um, to actually advocate for that support and and so that government actually can you know be serious about that and 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 make more public private partnership so i'm saying like private sector is still important but i think public sector is is has to play a role especially as joy mentioned about like when you when you consider about unbiased information and yeah. that's another challenge we are also looking at in in, in our in my research about uh, agri food misinformation because information is now intentional that is you know so in that context i think it's important uh and and we probably i don't know we'll also talk about probably artificial intelligence and chat gpt uh but i think uh, with growing concern and also the opportunities it is more important than ever that you know um public sector government, whether federal government or provincial government, pay more attention than they did maybe in the last 15 or 20 years. Today on Real Ag Radio, we're focusing on the future of ag extension and knowledge transfer. It is the Ag Policy Connection podcast that you can find wherever you get your podcasts, hosted by Kelvin Hepner, presented by Cappy, and we're going to hear more of the discussion when we come back. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio, 147, Sirius X. Join us for the Canadian Beef Industry Conference, August 19th to 22nd in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Spend time networking on the trade show floor, hear from keynote speakers, and take in breakout sessions designed to increase profit, manage your rangeland, and navigate trends. Get up close to advanced techniques and hands-on demos, and kicking it all off is Lamley's Bull Event. Proud, sustainable, and innovative, we are beef. Registration is now open. Visit CanadianBeefIndustryConference.com for full details and to register. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. It's summertime, and you've got a lot of important decisions to make when it comes to your corn crop. Let the Corn School on realagriculture.com help guide you through those big decisions with input from leading experts in the field. If it's spray timing, disease identification, or any other field issue, the Corn School's got you covered. The Corn School on realagriculture.com, brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. Today on Real Ag Radio, we are focused on the future of ag extension and knowledge transfer in our industry. We're listening to the Ag Policy Connection podcast, one of the recent episodes hosted by Kelvin Hepner and presented by Cappy. You know, you deal with many uncertainties on your farm. Managing risk should not be one of them. MNP's ag team specializes in risk management. Visit mnp.ca to learn how you can stay ahead of the game and plan for the unknown. Passing it back to Kelvin Hepner. Jake, why why does this matter? The uh, farmers' bottom lines are are doing okay in many cases, despite governments not investing in in extension. And uh, often there's been criticism of public publicly funded extension uh, resources not always being the most current or or the latest. Like often maybe a little bit behind in terms of research or or researching things that many farmers have already adopted. Those types of criticisms are are sometimes shared. 
does do we need to return to the extension model of 20 years ago when there was an ag rep or a extension person in in every region of the province or or uh, can we shift to more of a private funded model or 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 uh, what what do you see in terms of providing the most value to your farm uh, in uh, going in the next 5 10 years well you've raised some important points there kelvin in that you know, farming has changed a great deal. And, you know, we have access information that farmers never had access to 15, 20 years ago. Um, I think we have huge reliability problems, especially when it comes to something like AI. Um, you know, I guess just ahead of the meeting here, I asked ChatGPT, you know, what would be a, a good way to uh, run a fertilizer program for Durham wheat and the brown, dark brown soil zone in southeast Saskatchewan? And, one of its uh, suggestions was to uh, band and incorporate phosphorus and potassium ahead of seeding, which wouldn't exactly be a great practice. <laughs> but, you know, it'll hallucinate answers that, you know, to questions that it doesn't have information for. Now, services like this are the worst they're ever going to be. They're going to get better. But... For the next while, we have a serious reliability problem with with something like that. And I would also say that, you know, as a farmer, it is very difficult to try to, you know, sort through the volume of information available online today. It's very difficult to find things that are actually applicable to my farm. It's very difficult to search, you know, and find enough detail to be able to do that. But there are services popping up that are helping with, with that, like, Bruce Barker's uh, Canadian Agronomist is a good site uh, I found for, you know, dissemination of information. Um, we have a great professional agronomist that we work with in our farm that's always looking through all of this information and helping us determine what works for us on our farm. And I would also say that governments have agendas and agendas change. Um, you know, we've seen a, a significant, very significant focus on climate change in the past several years and you know our extension services have focused mainly on helping farmers apply for the off-calf program and and how to uh you know use practices that really aren't applicable for us in this part of the world like cover cropping and those sorts of things so one of the issues with extension is that even though it's public it doesn't mean it can't be biased towards a certain thing and i think that's what we've been seeing having said all that I do think that there is still a role for extension services, um, certainly in the realm of programs like OFCAP. If there's government funding um, available for doing different things, it is really useful for us to have somewhere that can sort of centralize that um, information and help with application of these programs, although the government ended up using different groups to do it anyway. So I guess for me, when I'm looking forward to what information I'm going to need on my farm. I'm always going to need some sort of a connection between my farm and the scientific community to be able to take what they're learning and apply it to my farm. What form that takes, I guess, isn't as important to me as, as it is that we get it, whether it's the crop commissions that are doing it, which are, you know, significant government funding goes into those as well, whether it's extension offices and in my local city like Weyburn, or whether it's some combination of all that, I think there's always going to be a role for public investment and extension. But I don't think we need to go back to what it used to look like. I think we need to adapt and evolve and fit government-funded extension into the environment that we have today and not try and go backwards. I hope that makes sense. Oh, yeah, for sure. Dad Harold, Jake talks about this information problem, just the overwhelming amount of information that's out there and some of the, the ways of, of screening it or, or filtering it. And I would say, I would put to put a plug in here, I would say media is also uh, in a website like Real Agriculture or Real Ag Radio or podcasts are a format too of, uh, of uh, or one example of, of and in many ways, I think that's what our function is in, in the media agriculture media world. Adharl, do you see artificial intelligence, the chat GPT models, like Jake says, they can only get better from here. Do you see that being uh, a, a model of uh, disseminating information, distilling it to, into a useful format, this overwhelming amount of info, getting it into a, a, a meaningful, actionable 
uh, message to to a farmer at the end of the day? Do you see that down the road? Yeah, I I see there is a there is a a, a you know good like a prospective future for using AI, but but the question is that um, how we plan that future. So I mean, if we think about it, is another tool that will you know automatically actually provide information, right information based on the technology itself, I think there is a real danger. I think it has to be taken as a process. So what I mean, um, as the technology evolve, we need to also critically ask question about, right? Uh, the ethics as well as, you know, um, the context of information being shared, right? Um, like fertilizer application in Saskatchewan and in Ontario has a very context specific kind of uh, practice, right? And so, I mean, it has to be adapted to the local uh, needs. So, I mean, the technology is there, but those technology has to be adapted to the location specific. It's not like a chat GPT, you know, there are some generic kind of thing. Agriculture is not a generic thing. As my, I mean, when I lived in many places of the world, it's same corn you produce in different ways, right? I mean, the science and 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 culture, you know, agriculture also has a cultural aspect of the practice. So um, to briefly respond to that question, I think um, the media uh, researcher. Uh, advisor as well as a farmer um, has to, I mean, we should not reject AI because of their negative consequences. I think we need to embrace, but more responsible way. Um, and that's, I think we see, we see it's a good future and more, you know, sustainable future through AI we can create, especially when it comes to you know, advising or, or, or enhancing advisory service. Joy, what's your perspective? We are seeing companies coming out with agronomy, AI models, large based on chat GPT or similar type uh, large language model uh, frameworks. Do they have a fit already or, or how close are they to being relevant in, in terms of what you see? And, and of course, in, in Olds College, you're doing all kinds of work with different companies and different technologies and sensors and, and different data input uh, uh, information networks and that type of thing. Yeah, there's definitely definitely a role for for AI. Um, I mean, the main value proposition of AI is is taking massive quantities of sort of disparate information and pulling it together in a way that that makes sense, right? But as has been already previously mentioned, um, the the regionality and the specific the spe the specifics get lost, I guess, in in AI interpretation today. Um, but the other the other piece of it is is historically. You know, farmers working with with agronomists or, or trusted advisors, it, it all comes down to that trust piece as well. So we need region specific information, not just the, the broad strokes of, you know, here's an interpretation of everything that is related to fertilizer management. Um, it needs to be region specific. And there's still some degree of trust required between uh, a farmer and the information provider. Right. So that's why I think the human element is still always going to be a, a key part. Um, but where AI and tools like um, AgVisor Pro and ChatGPT and, and these other pieces are, are going to be important going forward, but there still needs to be that trust element as well. Yeah, and some level of transparency. Jake talked about uh, different extension resources in the past already. Everybody has has a bias inherently. Uh, AI, will, there, need, there will need to be some transparent level of transparency to develop that trust as well. Yeah, Absolutely. You're listening to the most recent episode of the Ag Policy Connection podcast presented by CAPI, hosted by Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture. A great discussion on the future of ag extension and knowledge transfer. We're going to have more of this discussion when we come back. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. If you only listen to Real Ag Radio, you only get half the picture. For greater insight into the issues that affect farming, 
tune in to realagriculture.com. Crops, livestock, machinery, farm management and the markets, even food and travel. Real Agriculture Online digs deeper into the topics that affect the way you work and live. So get connected today. Read, watch and listen to the people who know at realagriculture.com. Choose Viatude Fungicide and unleash best-in-class sclerotinia protection in canola and premium protection against white mold in soybeans. Viatude contains a powerful premix of Onmira Active and Prothioconazole. This unique combo delivers high-performance disease control, crop safety, mix compatibility, resistance management, and advanced mobility for excellent coverage and superior plant protection. Choose Viatude Fungicide for stronger, more vigorous crops. We're continuing our conversation about the future of ag extension and knowledge transfer in the industry of agriculture it is the Ag Policy Connection podcast, and you can find it wherever you get your podcast. It's hosted by Kelvin Hepner and, of course, presented by Cappy. Let's continue the discussion. So do you see a place, one, so this is, I'm going to use an example here in, in media and journalism. I think a lot of media companies are, are wrestling with what AI is going to mean for their business, and I I'm convinced that in the future, new information, AI won't be great. There will, you'll still have value placed on new information and new findings and new, and new research. And do you see the same in agriculture when it comes to the role of AI? You're still going to need that original primary data to be developed somewhere. AI likely isn't going to be coming up with that. Do you, is, is that a fair, uh, fair comment, Joy? Absolutely. That's why I feel like egg research is is such an exciting place to be because it's never going to we're never going to answer all the questions or we're not going to have all the answers to all the questions that the egg sector has. So there's always going to be a need to generate new information and generate new 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 findings and new results for the various engines, whether it's artificial intelligence or or otherwise, to combine that and compile that in a way that again can be used for used by producers to make good management decisions to improve overall productivity and sustainability. Yeah. And we're talking about these AI models as if they are futuristic or, or like just cutting edge right now, but Google, Jake, I'm sure you've Googled, uh, searched for information in the past and, and come up with extension resources by a search engine in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. I mean, the technology is changing incredibly quickly, but the specificity is still a huge issue, as Adderall mentioned. I mean, I can I can Google anything that I want, and I can come up with stuff that's from the United States, from Africa, from India, and somewhere maybe after you click more results twenty times, maybe you get an article from Saskatchewan. You know, it's it's really difficult to actually be able to delve in and find information. You know, just as a farmer, like. Just trying to find basic information online is actually really difficult. And I would say it's becoming more difficult. The search engines don't seem to be, they seem to be optimizing the wrong direction, I guess, for us to be able to find specific information that works for us. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, like, like you mentioned earlier, sites like Real Agriculture and others like that are helpful because they, it's somewhere you can go rather than having to just do a direct search. Um, so, there is a there is a huge value and an important uh, part that sites like that play. We need Canadian based sites like Real Ag and, and others like it to be able to provide that more of a central hub of information. Yeah, Ada Harl, when you look around the world uh, in terms of the the future of knowledge transfer and extension and and uh, having farmers understand why maybe changes need to be made in, in practices or how that could improve their, their bottom lines. What do you see as, uh, as the future uh, of, of this topic? Are there certain models that you see being more successful and, and that you see us moving towards here in Canada as well, based on what you, what you've seen in other countries? Yeah. I mean, um, in that case, you know, the, it's a good question, but probably a very, um, discrete answer would be like between developing and developed world, what I've seen. In developing world, uh, if you go to 
India or maybe some African countries, you will certainly see how extension is still, uh, I would say, lifeblood of agriculture and agricultural development. And because there is more and more smallholder lives there, right? And when I lived in Europe and working in North America, it's more in industrialized agriculture. And you see that, you know, more large farmer is there, right? And I, I, have, I don't know much history, but I mean, when I read the history and I, I had the feeling like with the industrialization, with the what I say more corporate kind of uh, agriculture, um, like the the roles of extension um, for some reason, you know, in the, in the discourse has lost, right? Um, and, but think about like, we also have a small holder here, right? We also, we are also th talking about uh, climate change. We are also talking about sustainable agricultural practices. So the corporate model, I'm, I'm not, you know, um, <laughs> like, uh, I don't want to criticize the privatization model. I think it has its own value, but one thing, if, uh, and uh, one thing you, we need to understand that it has a profit tied in. It has a, you know, a gain tied in, right? A financial gain. So it has to play in that role, but the public, you know, um, responsibility for uh, government and other people or policymaker need to understand that, you know, we need to also think about those like who are a smallholder, um, you know, those who are working in uh, climate smart practices, right? So in that case, you know, I think it's important to think about that role. And um, I see the differences, as you're saying, like in some countries in Europe, for example, um, like if you go to Western Europe, you will see more kind of what we have seen in Canada. Like there is a less role of private sector. But if you go, go to Eastern Europe, you see still the government role is very important. Um, some country like New Zealand, for example, is highly privatized, right? And, um, but, uh, you know, um, in Australia, like, uh, you know, in that region, like neighboring countries, like they are still like the same kind of trend, like we have still private, public private kind of uh, extension. So our neighbor, um us i uh, still you know like that model uh, land grant system that we never had but we somehow followed in an early 1990s right and they also uh, moved to privatization but still retain land grant system and i i found like that still works still very important and we need to think about how we can bring back back this discussion with Research extension and farmers network um, in a in a some kind of private platform. I think in 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 Canada. Joy, what do you see in terms of the that uh, that setup in Canada in the future? Of course, in Alberta, you've seen major changes where the province withdrew, and it's that load has shifted to commodity groups and colleges like Olds College are are picking up some of it, and and. I think people, you're still trying to figure it out, like you said before. But where do you, how do you see that split being uh, uh, set up in the in the future? At Harl talked about in the U.S. land grant universities still that model still uh, still continuing to this day. Canada, it seems like we've seen more evolution, or uh, or there's been a lot of change in the last decade or two. How do you see that going forward? Yeah, it, it remains to be seen, I guess. But we're at we're at an interesting point where, like like has been mentioned already, that you know we, we need to evolve. We we don't need to to replicate the the type of extension models that we had 10, 20 years ago. There's different realities, different tools, um, just a different reality, right? So I think this this shift in in Alberta specifically is probably well timed because we need to think things think through things a little bit differently. One, one thing that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and, and trying to analyze over the last little bit is, is looking at, um, you know, because the ultimate, I guess, outcome or measure of success for extension is 
could, could be related to adoption rates of best practices and, and, and use of technologies. Um, so if we're looking at historically with, with the old model, looking at adoption rate of, you know, something transformal, transformational like uh, conservation tillage, it, it took 30 years to get from adoption rate of zero or 10% up to 80 or 90%. Um, and there was, you know, the, the extension model of the day was, was very much hands-on, very much regional specific. There was specialists in, in every area and conservation learning centers and, and places like that for, for producers to go get information and, and learn about this, this new practice. And it took 30 years. Um, if, if we're looking ahead and looking at, you know, production targets and um, emission reduction targets and things like that, that require adoption of best practices in the 80 to 90 range where we're currently at 20 to 30 percent, how how can we accelerate that that adoption? How can we change the way that we generate and share information? And then the flip side of extension is also, you know, researchers and various groups getting information back from producers around what questions do they still have, what what type of research or projects or activities or demonstrations need need to be done in order to answer answer the questions that are still out there so how how can we change that entire reality to try to accelerate adoption and try to accelerate improving productivity and, and sustainability so we don't know what it's going to look like like i said there's there's a lot of discussion happening in alberta and every every region every province seems to do it a little bit differently so there's lots of interesting models to look at to say hey what what do we need here in alberta um but it's it's probably well-timed and um, we can really change the way that extension is done, ho hopefully for the better and really help producers best maximize the value of that information. It, yeah, it is probably a, an ever-changing process. It's something that we're probably going to be continually evaluating what works best as technology changes, as information uh, ways of communicating change and, and all of that. Jake, in your, in your role as a director at Sask Wheat, you're a commodity organization that has uh, has invested in extension resources, possibly in reaction to uh, a provincial government funding less than it used to, or, or, or maybe it's just driven by demand. Maybe take us behind the scenes there in terms of the conversation at the Sask Wheat board level. How do you decide how much or, or whether to invest in extension for wheat growers in Saskatchewan? Yeah, we saw it as a gap. Um, extension services aren't what they were. Um, so we thought, you know, maybe a service that we could provide farmers would be to try and fill a little bit of that gap. So, you know, we we did put a bit of more of a focus on, you know, adding some services like an on-farm trial program. There is thousands of products out there and practices that farmers can try each and every year. And it's so difficult for us to figure out what to even look at, what to even consider doing a test on in our own farms, at least with a program like this and the other commissions are doing it too. You can compile replicated data from farms, you know, spread out across the province and hopefully get a much faster turnaround on whether a product or practice works um, and we've also tried to target farmers where they are, um, you know, podcasts, um, doing very informal type meetings or coffee shop talks, those sorts of things where we're not doing a bunch of big presentations, just just chatting with farmers. I mentioned earlier at the beginning that extension is a connection with between farmers and researchers and policy and all of that. That means it goes both ways. I think Joy raised a good point. Farmers are often ahead of the research committee community on things that they're trying, things that they're experimenting with. And I think it's important sometimes for the research and government community to recognize that. And sometimes farmers are the innovators. And, you know, sometimes they might be trying something that sounds a little strange, but 20 years down the road, you know, sometimes it, it takes things over. I mean, it was early adopters that first tried no-till. That's where it first came from. So, I think we just have to make sure that we're, you know, as an extension community, you're meeting farmers where they are um, and not trying to force, you know, a certain way of presenting information, you know, towards them is giving them information in a way that they can use it, which often means mobile. Um, it doesn't mean going into a government office. It doesn't mean going into town hall meetings. It means 
that while I'm sitting in the sprayer or the air drill or driving my truck down the highway, I can access information that's relevant to me and that's understandable to me. So that's something that it's asked week that we've tried to do. Um, and I, I think that, that the extension, you know, network would benefit from, from looking at a lot of those things. And I think that is happening. Um, but uh, that's kind of where I see it, I guess, when I put my farmer hat on it, I need accessible information that meets me where I am. When we come back, we're going to finish up the discussion on the future of egg extension and knowledge transfer in the industry of agriculture. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, of course, on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. How's your seed quality? What should you treat with? What about herbicide carryover and environmental concerns? Spring is here, and you've got a lot of things to think about in regards to your pulse crop. The Pulse School on Real Agriculture has information and advice for all these questions and more to help you navigate this season. Brought to you by BASF. Pulse School episodes are available at pulseschool.com, realagriculture.com, or as a podcast on your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one-hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. We've been listening to an excerpt from the Ag Policy Connection podcast hosted by Kelvin Hepner and presented by Cappy. The future of ag extension and knowledge transfer in our industry. Let's finish up. I think part of that accessibility too, and this is maybe one of the final themes we'll we'll discuss here is communication skills uh, of from in this in the science community and in the research community. I, I when you look at successful examples of extension, I, I often I find at least for, to me, individuals, personalities come to mind, individual people that were a force for a certain, something that they were passionate about and, and they communicated it well. At Aharl, is that something that in the academic community you see uh, there being a need for more emphasis on communication skills and having that ability to take that first step of, of converting research and distilling it into a, a message that resonates with the intended audience? Yeah, Kelvin, is a nice question. <clears throat> I have to say, like, you know, as a researcher, we are the most communicators. <laughs> and uh, I think we need more and more skills and, and tools and, 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 and techniques to, to, to become, you know, better communicator. And I would say effective communicator. Um, if time allows, I'd like to also respond a few things about what Jake and Joy mentioned. Sure, um, go ahead. And uh, one thing is, I really appreciate your your idea of Jake about farmers' innovation. And I was just thinking about like you know the way we think about research extension knowledge is like top down. I mean, it's not; it should not be a top down. I mean, farmers has a lot of innovation, and and because farmers use the research and adapt it, right? And in extension is has an important role to advocate that innovation. It's not a researcher, right? Um, and for the impact assessment, um, I think what Joy mentioned is very important. Uh, adoption is a very important component, but typically we think about extension as a return on investment. And there is one, a few, two study I know, one study shows that extension, based on 20 observation, extension actually gives 70, uh, like person of you know return of investment in you know when comparing with with other research, so it's based on the problem in adoption. But extension plays a huge role in terms of community development, in terms of what is information load. Jack is talking about, you know, there is so much information and how I can make informed decision, right? And extension is also part of uh, like releasing stress, like mental health for farmers, you know, because the connection is important and that connection is, should not be always virtual connection. There should be a human connection all the time. 
So when I what I wanted to say here that there is a technical aspect of thinking about impact assessment for extension that is adoption is always or economic return, but also there is a functional and social aspect of extension which is always get you know unrecognized. And I think it ha it has a lot of value. And if you really, I don't know if there is any formula, if you can calculate in terms of, you know, monetary value, you will see extension has even more value on that aspect. If there is no extension, in that days, farmers will still can operate, find the information through AI, through social media or whatnot on their personal, you know, uh, consultant. But that aspect can you can never be replaced, and that gets recognized. Um, so I just wanted to contribute. You know, I was just thinking it's very important that you know people know that. And uh, I think that your question is about science communication. I think uh, is very important, and especially also uh, penetration of artificial intelligence. You know, it is, as I said, I don't want to say the negative thing. It can be very scary. I was reading to Warren Buffett uh, comments about like, yeah, it will be a, a next century's beast, right? Of course, I think he thought about that because you see like the way AI now is being used, there is a more risk of misinformation and disinformation, right? So as I mean, for as a as a science communicator, as a researcher, if researcher doesn't understand how these tools are being used and how tool can be used responsibly, I think um, that there is a real danger in terms of even science communication. So in the past, it was important, but in the future or present, I think it's even more important for us to understand tools, understand the the style, the values, you know, of, of communicating information to the intended audience. Yeah, for sure. Joy, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I, at first I thought, yeah, but for sure, we need every single scientist to, to, to you know, go through some specific training to be a, a better, you know, a better communicator, a better ability to distill technical information into several different ways for different audiences, right? Um, but but when I thought about it a little bit more, I realized it, it it's a pretty special skill, I guess. And, and like you said, there right now there's there's definitely you know a couple dozen gems in in Western Canada right now anyway of, of people that just have a passion and have the ability to distill really complex information into a way that can be um, tangible and practical for farmers or even for policymakers or for other government officials in in different ways, right? Um, so I, I wonder if there's sort of a, a, a different model where there's, yes, sci scientists and, and, and science technical transfer people can, can maybe come part of the way and, and generate some additional skills over and above their research skills to translate information, but also continue to build on and invest in the next generation of those gems, those extension specialists that just have the passion for uh, working with various technical people and, and various scientists to bring a whole bunch of information together in, in one place. This has been a great topic. We weren't able to fit the entire episode into today's show. So please go to realagriculture.com and check out the Ag Policy Connection podcast. It is presented by Cappy, hosted by Kelvin Hepner. And I want your feedback. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com or call the Real Ag Feedback line, 855-776-6147. Thanks, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. And we will chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody.